Every week, Olivia and Sophia go to the library and bring back a few books. Usually one becomes Sophia's newfound favorite, and just recently her newfound favorite was the true story of the three little pigs, as told by a wolf, Alexander Wolf. Now this is the story of the three little pigs told from the point of view of the wolf. You see, the wolf was out because he just needed a little bit of sugar to finish making a cake for his granny. And so he went to his neighbor's house, knocked on the door, and, and was asking for a little bit of sugar. And the, the pig who lived there went and answered the door and, and the wolf was ready to move along when he felt a sneeze coming on. He was a little bit sick, maybe a bit of allergies, and he felt a sneeze coming on. And he sneezed a great sneeze, and that house just fell over. Right? Fell over, didn't see that coming. He went to check and see that the pig was okay. And the pig had unfortunately passed on. And so there was that pig sitting there in the wreckage of the straw house, and while well, he is a wolf, and that is a little bit of a ham dinner right there, sitting there. And so he didn't want to waste the pig who had accidentally lost his life. And so he had dinner. Still needed some sugar for the cake for his granny, so he moved on down the road to the next house, the brother of the pig, uh, who had built another house, uh, stick house, and the same type of thing, knocks on the door, no one answers. He's getting ready to go home, and he felt another sneeze coming on, and you can guess how this turns out. He sneezed, and the house fell over, and he went to check on the pig, and you know, you hate to waste a ham dinner. And there was that pig, it hadn't survived, and not gonna waste a ham dinner. He is a wolf, and wolves get ravenously hungry. I was thinking about uh, this as I was reading about the passage this year. We are reading at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus talks about, beware wolves in sheep clothing. They are ravenously hungry. And I thought of this, the story, the story of the wolf. I mean, you can't blame the wolf, right? That's just what the wolf's going to eat. The wolf has ravenously hungry, unhealthily hungry, hungry for what is in an unhealthy fashion. That's what the warning here is. And then this unhealthy hungry, or this unhealthy hunger, that's a, a, a hunger that we do see on occasion, right? If you think about leaders, the warning here is don't follow a leader who is ravenously hungry. We do encounter leaders who are hungry for that which they should not be hungry for. Hungry to stir the pot. Hungry to, to, to instead of building peace, building a division, determining who is in and who is out. There can be leaders who can acquire a taste, an unhealthy, ravenous taste, not for that which is healthy, but for that which is unhealthy, that which causes problems, that which devours the sheep that the leader is supposed to be leading. In this first of the three warnings here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns us to be very careful who we follow as our leaders. We choose who we are going to follow, and it is not wise to follow a leader who is ravenously hungry, hungry for the wrong things, for they are sheep or wolves in sheep's clothing. This warning, Jesus continues, the way you tell is you tell by their fruit. Right? Thorns cannot grow grapes, thistles cannot grow figs, bad trees cannot grow good fruit. The challenge being it takes a season to tell what fruit is being grown. But if we listen long enough, if we watch, the true colors of any leader will come shining through. If a leader is gracious and humble, peaceable, or is a leader arrogant and ravenous and healthy for division. The leader who is the, the humble one submits first to Jesus and it is thus, thus safe for us to submit to him or her. And the fruit of following such a leader, Jesus shows us at the end of these three warnings, is that when the weather turns nasty, when the storm strikes, those who have followed the, the good leader are like those who have built their house upon the rock, for the wind blew and the house did not fall. Those who build their lives following a leader who is unhealthily hungry for that which ought not be sought, well, they're building upon the sand. 
Having given a warning about who we follow, addressing leadership, Jesus moves to the second of the three warnings. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom to come, the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who prays, Lord, Lord, not everyone who sings, Lord, Lord, not everyone who shows up on Sunday to hear, Lord, Lord, preached, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Most interesting word in that entire line is the word my, my father. As Jesus is saying this, he says, my father. Those who say, Lord, Lord, he doesn't say it's our father. The person who's saying, Lord, Lord, and then Jesus, it's not our father. It's my father. The sort of implication there being that the person who's saying, Lord, Lord, if it had been their father and thus our father, they would have done what their dad said. That's what it means to have a father. If you do what your dad says. When the dad says something, the response is, yes, sir. Right? And so Jesus is saying, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is doing the will of our father. Because if they were doing the will of our father, it would be our father. No, it's not doing the will of my father. Because if it was our father, you would have done something. All right. Put another way, we can worship all the time saying, Lord, Lord, but a worship service does not, that does not lead to service out there really wasn't much worship to begin with. Worship is never the goal. It's only ever the launching pad. It's the beginning. Worship is the beginning of what is to follow. It's never the end. We begin here, choosing to follow Jesus, then Jesus follow, leads us out there. Jesus spends most of his ministry out there, rarely showing up at synagogues. In the same way, our ministry is out there. We show up here to say, Lord, Lord, and then we follow Jesus out to do our Father's will. Now, it is true that over the centuries, the church has given in to temptations to make it easy to say, Lord, Lord, and not question the rest of how we live. Whether it was the German Christians of the 1930s who said, Lord, Lord, but then didn't question what was happening to their Jewish neighbors. Whether it was the Southern Christians of the 1950s, Southern America, who said, Lord, Lord, on Sunday morning, at the same time that their black brothers and sisters in Christ were saying, Lord, Lord, but then went out uh, and enforced the Jim Crow laws. And today, I think the analog would be immigrants, right? We say, Lord, Lord, and then we get to passages in Scripture like Deuteronomy 10, where it tells us, you shall love the stranger, for you were a stranger in Exile. You were a stranger in Egypt, right? You were a stranger in Egypt. The, the word stranger is another way of saying immigrant, not from around here. Jesus says in Matthew 25, When I was hungry, you gave me food. Thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. The word stranger there, xenos, as in xenophobia, talking about the stranger, someone who's not from around here, someone who is the immigrant. Right? So there, there's always a way in which the church is sort of tempting us to, to gloss over what is out there. So we say, Lord, Lord, here, and then we start missing things out there. Right? This is not a, a new temptation, whether it was the monastics of the Middle Ages, where the monks and the nuns, they were understood to be the ones who were the holy ones. They, they would do everything Jesus asked, and then us normal folks who weren't the monks, we, we didn't have to do anything because we were like second-class Christians. The monks, they, the nuns, they would do everything, then they would pray for us. Right? There, there have been ways to cop out and, and to, to sort of step back from actually fully following Jesus for a long time, right? This is a temptation that's happened many times over the centuries. Again, the way to tell whether we have said, Lord, Lord, and whether we have then actually followed our Lord in our day-to-day -day living gets back to uh, the fruit of how we're, we're doing. If we are saying, Lord, Lord, and then building our life day by day, on following him when the weather turns nasty, when the storm strikes, well, the lives we built will make it. Right? 
That's, that's how to tell whether uh, this warning has been heeded. The third warning that Jesus offers is an interesting reversal. We have heard about the danger of leadership that uh, is ravenously, unhealthily hungry. We have heard the uh, warning about following Jesus, following Jesus and focusing on what we say but not what we do. Now Jesus warns us about what we do and how, well, why what we do. Well, the, the, the doing itself needs a little bit more. Jesus says, uh, that people will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy with your name and cast out demons with your name and do many deeds of power with your name? All right, this is one of the, another case where uh, the small words matter. Right, who's doing the prophesying? Who's casting out demons? Who's doing all of these things? It's we. Didn't we do all these things? And so who, who's actually uh, kingdom is being sought there? Whose will is being followed? Right? This is a sense that these are people who are doing good things, but they're doing these good things not because they want to follow Jesus as Lord, but because they're doing their own thing, building up their own sense of how things should be. And then they're doing things with Jesus' name. Didn't we cast out uh, demons with your name? Prophecy with your name? Do many deeds of power with your name? Or you can translate it as by your name. But the, the sense there is... Um, it's like they're treating Jesus like a pocket knife you pull out to do a tool. I gotta do something here. Hey, I gotta do this deed of power. Let me pull out the name of Jesus to, to do what I was gonna do anyways. Right? And, and if this is the case, it, the people who are doing the, these good things, they're, they're doing them for their own purposes. Right? So Jesus says to them, Be gone. I never knew you. Right? I never knew you. If we try to use Jesus as a tool, just pray in Jesus' name and everything will work out. Do the, do the good things that you're going to do anyways, but pray and say you're doing it in the name of Jesus. That's not actually following Jesus. Jesus does not know you because you, we're not following in his footsteps, seeking to be his disciple. We see this today, people who go to the Bible with an agenda, people who go to the Bible with, with a position that they have already established, people who have a, a politics that they're just looking to the Bible to support. And I can promise you that you can go to the Bible with any politics or any point of view, and if you twist it or you stare or you do kind of a buffet approach to the Bible, you pick a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you can bend it to make it do whatever you want. You can take the Bible and make it jump through hoops if you try hard enough. All right? But that's us trying to use the Bible to back up our own opinions, much like these people are trying to use Jesus to, to build their, their own kingdom. Right, and, and if you get gets to looking at the Bible, you know, my friends, let me, let me propose that when we open the Word of God, that's a powerful thing. And, and it's not us who are reading the Bible. We're not the ones who are looking at the Bible and, and determining what it means and what it means for us. And we're not the ones determining what we're going to follow and all of that. We're not, we're not reading the Bible. When we open up and read the Word of God, the, the Bible is reading us. We bring our lives and we put them in front we put our lives in front of the words of Jesus and we don't judge Jesus. Jesus judges us, right? And, and so if you haven't gone to the Bible and found that it is confusing or frustrating or disagreeing with you, I'm not sure that you've read it. Right? If you haven't been annoyed or angry at the words of the scriptures, then you might need to go back and read it some more. Because it happens on a regular basis. I'll read something. No, that can't be. No, that can't. Yeah, that's, we, we do these things. We go and we read scripture and we start looking at all of it. And we find out real quickly that Jesus does not line up with our worldview and our politics. Jesus is not a Republican or a Democrat, capitalist or socialist. Jesus is not American or any other nationality. Jesus is Lord. You either follow him as Lord, we either follow him as Lord, or we don't. Right? For those who acknowledge this, everything else is secondary. That's what we proclaim on Sunday mornings, and that's what changes what we do then on Thursday afternoons. If we try to use Jesus 
and, and as a kind of a switchblade or a pocket knife to do what we want. We skip worship. We're not worried about what we say on Sunday. Then we go out and do our own thing. You know what happens when the storm shows up? Well, if we've been doing our own thing, well, we haven't been building on the rock, have we? Right. The fruit of good leadership is that the flock weathers the storm. The fruit of good worship is that it leads to a transformed life that weathers the storm. The fruit of seeking the politics of Jesus and not our own agenda and what we do is that we weather the storm. It does not say that those who follow Jesus, as he has laid out here on the Sermon on the Mount, will not have to endure the storms. It says that those who do so will be building on the rock and be able to weather the storm. They will not fall. Right? Jesus has these three warnings that he offers. And, and, you know, he's kind of putting the smack down. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He has offered his, his invitation. He has described throughout the Sermon on the Mount what it looks like to follow him. And now he is putting the smack down and saying, you know, here it is. Here are some warnings about what happens if you don't follow what I'm laying down. And if you do this, you'll be building on rock. And if you do not do this, then, well... It's not going to go well for you when the storm comes. And I, I admit it's kind of hard to preach this because I don't want to sound like a jerk, but Jesus is kind of putting it down strong, and he's just putting it down strong. Right? When it comes to leadership, he's laying out clearly, follow leaders who desire peace. When it comes to worship, let our, let, let our worship change the rest of our lives. When it comes to what we do, let what we do be guided by what we say here. There's this sense of urgency to what Jesus warns. The Sermon on the Mount begins with its invitation and it ends with this warning. Pay attention. Pay attention. Build on what Jesus has says. And when the storms strike, you will have built on the rock. And having built on the rock, you will weather that storm. Right? What's the worst time to realize you need to work on your foundation? What's the single worst moment to realize you've got to work on the foundation of the house that you've built, the life you have lived? What's the worst moment to realize that you need to change your ways? It's when the storm's already striking. You don't work on the foundation when you're halfway through the storm, because that's when the water's already coming in. You work on your foundation when the sun sh still shines. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Amen.